Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The MAD7 Nucleates in Plant Editing Overcoming CRISPR Bottlenecks with MAD Tiger. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Inscripta. To learn more, please visit inscripta.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd now like to welcome our speakers. Ben Meitz, Senior Director, Enzyme Engineering at Inscripta, and Gabino Sanchez, Business Development Director at Hudson River Biotechnology. Ben and Gabino, you may now begin your presentations. All right, thank you, Kelly. appreciate it. Um, so I'll be uh, starting today and just giving some general information about Inscripta and the MAD7 nuclease before uh, Gabino uh, gives a presentation more specifically about Hudson River's work in plants. So firstly, just a little background on Inscripta, the company. So Inscripta is a company working on developing genome editing tools and developing CRISPR-based platforms for highly multiplexed genomes, genome engineering. Uh, Inscripta was founded in 2015, originally as Muse Bio. Uh, we have a large and growing uh, patent estate, specifically in gene editing and automation. The headquarters for the company is located in Boulder, Colorado, uh, but we also have sites in Pleasanton, California, and San Diego, California. Today, I'll be speaking about uh, specifically MAD7, uh, which is part of our uh, collection of MADzyme nucleases, and I'll also touch a little bit on Onyx, which is our genome engineering platform, which we started shipping to customers this year. So Onyx, as I mentioned, is our automated genome engineering platform, essentially a benchtop biofoundry for microbial genome engineering. It's a combination of a proprietary instrument, uh, you can see pictured on the left here in this slide, uh, chemistry uh, reagents that we manufacture and associated software. So uh, really the goal of this instrument is to uh, take the build portion of uh, a biofoundry and uh, reduce that to an instrument that you can buy uh, that sits on your lab bench. And using the software we provide, it makes the process of designing and building uh, thousands of edited microbial strains a very simple, quick uh, push button operation. And uh, the instrument currently works with uh, E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and as I mentioned earlier, um, is, is now shipping to, to customers and, and launched in, in Q1 2021. So today we're going to talk uh, specifically about MAD7. So MAD7 is a novel CRISPR nuclease that Inscripta discovered in 2017. So it's the first of a family of type 5 uh, non-Cas9 CRISPR nucleases. Uh, Inscripta had patent claims allowed for this enzyme in March 2018. Uh, one thing we did that is uh, a little bit unusual was that we essentially gave uh, MAD7 uh, to the scientific community for, for a lot of different applications. So. Uh, we have free access to academic and commercial entities for a number of, of different applications. And there are a, a, a small set of applications for which you will require a license. Um, we always try to um, uh, have reasonable terms for those commercial licenses for those applications. And since we launched MAD7 in 2017, we've seen pretty wide adoption in academia and industry. Uh, we have hundreds of, of licensees, a lot of them under the free license since 2017. And we've seen multiple third party publications in the academic literature from different groups using MAT7 in, in different cell systems. 
So today, I'm just going to give a brief rundown of some of those examples of different groups that are working with MAT7 and editing different kinds of, of cells. So uh, we've seen that it is an enzyme that is quite robust in its activity in different host cell systems. Uh, we've worked with it in obviously microbial and also mammalian cell systems. Uh, if you're interested, we do have some quick start guides and user guides available uh, that will help you, uh, you know, get started working with MAT7 in uh, even microbial or mammalian cell systems. So today I'm just going to briefly describe some of the data that's been published for MAT7 in mammalian cells, uh, an example of work in bacteria, and prokaryotes, and then an example in plants. And obviously, uh, Gabino is going to provide a, a lot more information and data about working with, with, with plants for, for MAT7 as well today. Okay, so here's the first example. Uh, this is just showing that MAD7 is able to edit efficiently in mammalian cell culture and animal models. So this is a paper uh, published by Horizon Biosciences in 2020. And what they showed is that they were able to achieve uh, high efficiencies of targeted gene disruption and also knock-ins using MAD7 as a nuclease in both um, human tumor cell lines and rodent embryos. And what we're looking at in this data on the right here is uh, T7E1 mismatch data. So uh, the lower bands on these gels are an indication that uh, MAD7 is cutting and then indels are being created and, and detected using this assay. And they did this on a number of different targets in, uh, in this case, HCT116 cells. And what we're looking at on the top is uh, a number of different guides that were tested at the PPIB locus and on the bottom, the DNMT3B locus. And on the far right, we have a negative control and next to that on the right, a SPCAS9 positive control. And what you can see at the bottom there is of, of each of these figures is the uh, editing that they detected using this assay in percent of total cells. And for three different loci for MAD7, uh, in both cases, they were able to achieve edit rates for those best uh, guides that were comparable to what they observed for the SPCAS9 controls on the right. So you can see for the PPIB locus, for example, with CAS9, they were able to see about 26% editing and at uh, you know, two of the guides they selected for MAD7, around 20% editing. So a, a good indication that MAD7 is uh, you know, very active and effective deplays in mammalian cells. Uh, so Horizon also did some work with precise editing. So uh, here we're showing some data in U2OS cells where they have used MAD7 to insert a tag into the uh, into the human CPX1 gene. And this tag essentially is a, a EGFP insertion. And uh, you can see on the right here by epifluorescence microscopy uh, for Cas9 on the top and MAD7 on the bottom that they were able to observe fluorescent cells, which is an indication that this integration event of this GFP tag did in fact take place in these cells. And they were also able to confirm this um, by uh, Sanger sequencing of the gene region in, in these host cells. So again, a good indication that MAD7 is working well in mammalian cells, not just for uh, indels and knockouts, but also for, for precise editing as well. All right, and um, there are other groups using MAD7 for cell and gene therapy applications as well. So uh, it has been uh, shown that MAD7 is able to uh, induce editing in IPS and stem cells uh, by a number of cell therapy licenses that we work with. Um, we also have some variants of MAD7 I'll touch on a little bit later, but those are also being tested by cell and gene therapy companies in, in preclinical research for knock-ins at safe harbor loci and, and knockouts or edits for, for allogeneic therapies. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, there was also uh, some work that's been done with MAD7 in uh, different bacterial hosts. So this is some data from a paper that was published from the University of Edinburgh, uh, working with MAD7 in Bacillus subtilis. What we're looking at on this data in the bottom is 
uh, editing efficiency with MAD7 um, at uh, a couple of different loci along with some Cas9 controls. So in these figures, we're looking at uh, a, a number of different negative controls and then uh, the bars you see are uh, samples that uh, include MAD7 um, or, and Cas9, uh, you know, and, and, this, and the correct guide for, for targeting. So you can see uh, in, in both cases, very uh, comparable results for Cas9 and MAD7 for editing in Bacillus subtilis. So uh, very high uh, efficiency of, of editing for MAD7. So over 90 and I believe at 100% of, of the companies they tested in this case. Um, so they were able to also show that they could do CRISPR eye knocking knockdowns with a catalytically dead version of MAD7 in Bacillus subtilis as well. All right, and um, final example here is just a little bit of work that is being published in plants. Again, Capino is going to go into much more detail about, about the Hudson River's work in plants. Um, but this is a publication from the Chinese Academy of Sciences where they were able to edit uh, rice and wheat efficiently with MAD7. So the data we're looking at on the bottom here is uh, work that they did uh, um, with uh, rice and wheat protoplasts editing with MAD7. And you can see uh, you know, different rates of indels were observed uh, at different sites, but in most cases they were able to see uh, some, some indels and you know, indication that the MAD7 is working quite efficiently in these systems. They tested both TTN and uh, TTTN and CTTN PAMs, and again, they saw uh, pretty uh, equivalent and efficient editing at, at both of these different PAM sets. All right, and I mentioned the Onyx platform earlier. Of course, MAD7 um, is at the heart of, of Inscripta's uh, genome editing platform. <clears throat> so uh, MAD7 is the enzyme that we use in this system. It's able to drive us to uh, robust and very efficient editing in E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Onyx system is also able to create a, a really diverse set of edit types. So um, uh, you know, obviously uh, SNPs, but also deletions, insertions, uh, changes to coding sequences, the ability to um, add, for example, promoters, and it's able to do all these edits at the at the genome-wide scale. So, um, you know, for example, you're able to add promoters to every single gene in a genome for, for a given experiment, if that's what your goal is. Um, yeah, and obviously, if you want more information on Inscriptas on its platform, um, Go to our website, and, and there's a lot of uh, additional information there that, that, that you know you can learn a lot more about the system and how, how it might be valuable. All right, and then lastly, uh, we have developed uh, additional enzymes beyond MAD7. So we have uh, some improved variants of MAD7 that we've developed, and we did this through a process of um, building and screening in high throughput very large libraries of variants of, of the MAD7 nuclease. Uh, so we have variants that have expanded PAM preference, if that's something in, that's important for your uh, given application. We also have variants that have uh, higher fidelity and low off-target activity, which can be very valuable for certain therapeutics applications for, for nucleases. Uh, in addition, we have a collection of uh, novel MADzymes outside of MAD7. So we have enzymes that are uh, very active and precise specifically for in vitro applications, um, for example, diagnostics applications. Um, we also have some nucleases that have a very broad natural PAM preference, if that's something that's valuable for, for your work. Um, if you're interested in learning more about these uh, variants of MAD7 or other uh, MADzyme nucleases, um, uh, this is the contact uh, details for us. It's also on, on our website if you want to reach out. All right. Um, so uh, that is the end of my content. I'm happy to hand it over to uh, Gabino from Hudson River Biotech to, to provide more information about working with MAT7 implants. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for the first introduction. And again, thank you very much to the Inscripta Institute and LabRoots for organizing the, the seminar. Um, let me go to my presentation. I will talk, to, uh, as Ben mentioned, our experience at Hudson River Biotechnology on how we are using MAT7 for plant editing. 
and first give you an overview of the CRISPR bottlenecks, uh, not only at the technical level, but also at the, at the regulatory level, and why we, what are the bottlenecks we are facing and how we are overcoming these, these bottlenecks. So for that, let me first introduce Hudson River Biotechnology. It's a company also founded in 2015, like in, Chris, in Scripta, indeed. Um, our focus has been on the agricultural, as an agricultural biotech company. We have around 50 employees today, and our mission is to develop technologies to reach the societal demands and sustainability challenges that they are for the agriculture. Hudson River is based in the Netherlands, in Wageningen, close to the university. And we are, basically, we are not a seed company. We are a technology provider, which puts us a little bit different from other propositions that you will see in the gene editing space in plants. And our, uh, we are an independent company and who has recently uh, completed a Series A funding from our own investors. So we have a very good idea of where do we want to go in terms of technology and how can we address these societal demands. If you if you look at the drivers for, for innovation in terms of uh, what agricultural needs is to adopt new technologies. And why are the drivers for that? First of all, the growing population. If you look at 2015-50 projections, we are expecting around 10 billion people in upon the planet. And how are we going to supply food for them? We need around 40% more of the food that we are supplying today. So that, that is a challenge for the, for the supply chains. And we need to secure enough food, for, and enough quality of this food. That's a, that is a tremendous challenge. The other challenge, of course, is that we know about, for example, climate change and other and the, and the footprint that the agricultural is putting on the ecosystems. And we know, for example, that the projections is that by 2050, there will be a 17% of harvest losses just due to climate change. And 30% of the arable land will be lost. So, so how are we going to feed the world while we are getting less and less uh, yield from the, from, the, from the existing crop? So how are we going to, the, the challenge is how are we going to grow more with less input in a sustainable manner. So, so these are major drivers for, for the agricultural field to, to improve and adopt new technologies. And, and, and if, you, if you look at in Europe, for example, we have identified some of these, uh, these challenges and they are now targets for the new, for the new uh, programs, funding programs in 2030, for example, we are estimated at 23% of losses already in 2030. Uh, with 10% of arable, ar less arable land and 13% less of yield. So all these things prompted to the European Union to come up with some, okay, what are the solutions here? And, and immediately the solution was, okay, technology can help us to generate new varieties and the breeding timing to develop these varieties should be shortened in order to meet the demands in a time frame that is actually reasonable. So they come up with a couple of a couple of very big funding proposals there called the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork, which addresses, for example, three major bottlenecks here. And they say, okay, the goals are very ambitious. So let's try to reduce half and 50% the use of uh, chemical pesticides. Let's reduce 50% of nutrient losses and reduce of fertilizers by at least 20% and try to achieve at least 20% in using organic farming to produce food. So all these are very ambitious goals, but, but when you look at the, the reality is how are you gonna achieve these goals unless you adopt the newest technologies? And, and how I put it like that is always when I use this, this uh, idea of the green revolution in the last century helped us immensely to increase the amount of produ uh, production of food. This is a great thing. So you can see here on the left part how the green revolution in the last 100 years through mechanization, the use of agrochemicals and even molecular breeding has helped us to increase the yield of many, many, many crops. Uh, ho however, there has been a cost associated to that, which is the increase of the environmental impact of agriculture in the environment. And that's, that, that is a big, big problem. So the solution that is put out there that we need to embrace is to use the, uh, the agri-tech revolution, which aims for uh, the, uh, in basically keep or even increase the production of food, the, the plants, but at the same time, decrease dramatically the impact in the environment. That's, that's what we are aiming for. And 
And for that, there are two major there are no two major focuses, and that we will uh, Hudson River Biotechnology we identify, and we see that one of them is enhancing the plants, make the plants new varieties that are adapted to these challenges that I was talking about. And we will do it through gene editing, and we will talk about the mad tiger workflow that we have developed in order to improve plants. And the other one that we'll briefly touch upon is the deliver efficient delivery of agrochemicals into the uh, into the system uh, through nanoparticle delivery uh, systems like the plant trans molecules that I will briefly mention around. Um, yes, in order to start with the breeding part for for, in, for improving the existing varieties, the traditional methods. I try to illustrate them here with a very simple example in which you have, let's say, a elite variety of a of your crop of, 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 of interest that it has a phenotype and is a white flower and you would like to have a new a new trait that is demanded by society by the environment by the consumer and, and let's say it's about getting red a red petal and then the breeding companies get together and say okay well to my elite variety that is already in the market i need to introduce this new trait so i cross the plants the, the elite variety with the new plant that i have maybe in my germplasm and I expect that the offspring it will have some sort of the gene of interest there, uh, but together with other genes that are coming in this cross. Through several cycles of breeding, you will basically are try to backcrossing, try to get the, the clean genetic material that at the end will give rise to the variety with the elite uh, characteristics and only with the new trait of interest associated with that. So that's, that's basically a traditional method that, as you can imagine, is the major bottleneck when you are talking about product development to plants into market. So once the, the scientists know which genes, for example, are involved in the trait of interest, which sometimes takes a very long time, but once we know that, the longest period here to develop a new variety is these crosses, this way of traditional breeding to try to bring the right genetics into the plant. That takes, in average, between five to seven years. And that depends on the crop. Sometimes it's even further, like 14 years. And so, so you can imagine that anything that can really change this period and shorten it is a massive change for the industry. Because what the promise of, of, of course, is when you look at the, how CRISPR can change this, you can go back to the breeding companies and say, theoretically, you could shorten this to one single year. And they were looking at you like, wow, really? So this is a really groundbreaking technology. Can we use it? And yes, they start thinking about, uh, oh yes, now we can talk about uh, using a trade catalog. We can think about our crop and we can look at the societal demands or what the consumer is demanding. And we can introduce specific traits that makes a very good business case for us. So we can talk about agronomic traits that they are very important for the for the for the farmer, and for the breeding companies, and in that case we are talking about, for example, things like yield, things like like the, the flowering time, things that are very important for the farmer, but also for the sustainability. So we can look for plants that they are able to uh, resist, for example, fat pathogens without the use of insecticides. We can look at the other ones that they are more. Uh, adapted to the climate change conditions, so we will be way more sustainable in the future. So these agronomic traits could be traits that we can add to the plants of interest. But also for the consumer side, we can add new characteristics that they are demanded by the consumer. For example, we can talk about extended shelf life in your fridge after you buy the fruit from the supermarket, or maybe new products like allergy-free products, or with improved taste, nutritional quality, you name it. So this is a very good uh, opportunity for the industry to really meet the demands if we manage to get this technology in place. Why I'm saying that? Because in Hudson River Biotechnology, we've been exploring this market for some time already, in which we've been talking to the customers, in our case, many of the breeding companies, they come up with, hey, we have a proposition for you guys. We have a trait, maybe on the consumer side, maybe on the, on the, on the, on the farmer side, and we would like to transform the plants that we have. So we've been through this cycle in which they tell us which gene maybe they're interested to find out. And we we edit that gene using our tiger workflow and we manage to get them back the solution in terms of a plant. And this is the, this is the revolution for them. But uh, the, besides the technology problems that I will mention later, 
we've been looking also at other type of uh, regulatory issues that they are related to the, the adoption of gene editing, which is the type of edits that they are allowed to be uh, to be commercialized by the by the breeding companies, by the, by the farmers at the end. And this has to do with, for example, how the edits are, are, do, are done by the by the nucleases, like not seven. Uh, in the case of the the CRISPR ones, if if there is a there is a uh, there is no template used, it's a guided repair from the from the nuclease. Is these type of edits are called SDN ones, and these SDN ones uh, are allowed to be sold as non-GM in many countries, but not, for example, in other countries like Europe. So th this is possible in some countries. If you use a template like like the the, the, and you are guiding the type of modification that you would like target into, into your gene of interest. These modifications are called SDN2s, is that they are big ones, then becomes SDN3s. Uh, SDN2s and SDN3s right now fall under the category of uh, genetic modified organisms and they are excluded for most of the uh, commercialization. So therefore you have to understand that we need to come up with really clear examples to the, to the, to the industry where editing can be uh, for for these changes that they are unguided and that they are safe for the consumer so you can see when, when we look at the world how is adopting the gene editing for for commercialization we see the the countries in green here the gene editing crops are not regulated as gm so actually some of them you know, are not even labeled as gm in other cases in in, in yellow you have countries that they are developing the, 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 the legislation surrounding the use of gene uh, genome edited crops for commercialization while, while other ones like europe as i'm saying before already has, has regulated completely all all edited products as gm and therefore they, they are not allowed for the consumer so so you have a, di a different adoptions here and 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 that has prompted a, a, a picture like this when we are talking about editing uh, gene editing adoption into the plant in, in the plant breeding industry you see that there was a lot of expectations as i was saying before what can we do we have a trade catalog that we can introduce in our crop of interest but this peak of uh, inflated expectations faced the wall one of the walls is i'm saying the regulation that's one but the second one is the one i'm going to talk today is about the technical the technical bottleneck and that gave us we give up to the trough of the disillusionment where, where expectations were really, really down and people, you do not see things happening in the supermarket as you would expect at this moment. Uh, but we hope that with the, the use of MAT7 and the, the Tiger workflow that I'm explaining now, we, we have managed to get some of these, uh, what, what we call them, the, the technical barriers. And one of them is about editing efficiency. The key aspect here is that if your nucleus is not efficient enough, you will end up with screening plants later on until you find a plant with the edit of interest. And that will be a very lengthy, cost laborious process. And if you do not do that, you have to introduce foreign DNA to use it as a marker, or you have to use it as a way to, to introduce the editing machinery. If you don't have a, a really good nucleus with a high efficiency, this is a very difficult process. The second one is about the CRISPR, CRISPR licensing. Uh, as Ben mentioned, the, the, the commercial proposition that Inscripta have regarding MAT7 made uh, for us a very clear decision of how to approach this. We are going to use MAT7 and the, the commercial attractiveness that MAT7 is for our customers when we have a commercial license to use uh, MAT7. And all our customers say this is a great proposition using MAT7 compared to other propositions that they are out there. Third parties involved here. And the third one is about the use of foreign DNA or Chimera. So if the end product of, of your workflow is a product that contains foreign DNA, many of the regulations that I was talking about won't allow you to use that product for commercialization. You have to get rid of foreign DNA. And that means cycles and cycles of breeding that will take, again, years and years. And moreover, if your, your end product contains the edit, but some of us do not, you will end up a product that is not behaving homogeneous enough for a supermarket to sell, to sell the product. So you, again, have to clean up your material until it's homogeneous. And that is requires, again, 
years and years. And again, it becomes not a promise of the technology that we were talking at the beginning. And finally, but not the least, Plants have had the most complex genomes out there in terms of size of the genome, but also in terms of fluidity. And that means that when you are talking about this, this knockout, for example, one gene, you're talking about multiple alleles in several families, and that is a nightmare from the, uh, from the multiplexing point of view. And unless the technology is mature enough, we are not going to these multi multiplexing uh, targets in your gene editing scheme. So we took all these challenges at Hudson River Biotechnology one by one. We were addressing them, and we managed to convey a okay, summarize in the next slide. I, I, I talked about the traditional breeding approach that it will take years and years, five to seven, sometimes even 14 years until you manage to get it done. Well, yes, we managed to get now CRISPR into the, with other with other proposals out there that you will see. Um, it will take us to an intermediate product that is still not ready for commercialization. You still need to have some cleaning up cycle that actually you have the product in the market. So, so um, several people at the R&D departments of these breeding companies will tell you, well, then what, what is the advantage? I mean, we will save a few years, but actually we will do basically the same type of activity. So the breakthrough here is to use a technology like the tire workflow that the breeding companies give us an elite variety today, and only with one round of editing, we give back an elite variety only with a change of interest inside the host genome and nothing else, and the, the plants are ready for commercialization immediately. That is the, that is the, the breakthrough here. And, and how we achieve that? We achieve that through basically four pillars here. First is that we do not introduce nothing, no, no DNA is introduced in this process. So we have a transgene free editing approach that I will explain a little bit earlier. But uh, the second one is that we have a proprietary guide soft design software for uh, the MAT7 guide design, guide, guide that, is, uh, that we have optimized for the, for, the, for the plant. The third one, and I think is the most important one, is the MAT7, the use of MAT7, not only for the commercially attractive proposition that is for the third parties, but also because we achieve efficiencies that go beyond 40 and 60 percent, depending on the, on the on the on the crops, and that is what allows us to move in a transgene-free manner. And that I will explain with some examples what I mean with that. And finally, but not least, we have this uh, a single cell regeneration technology in place that allows us to grow back a plant from a single cell that has been edited by Matt Seven. And once we have that, we can guarantee that the whole plant that comes out of that is homozygous for the trait of interest. And that is, in one round, we can do that. So, so that, that's why we can guarantee that between six to 18 months, you give us an elite variety here, and we give you back the elite variety back only with the gene, the gene of interest edit. And that is, that is as I'm saying, this is a, something that has changed the, the, the industry. Uh, and we have proven to work in different species which, which uh, makes us ourselves, as I'm saying, as a technology provider, this is what we are aiming. We do not specialize in just one species. We try to provide uh, the tiger workflow for many different species and many different crops. The, I will go really quickly through this. The tiger workflow is basically an acronym for the four steps that takes it, take it the place into the uh, CRISPR editing uh, workflow. The first is the target identification in which the, the, the gene of interest regarding the trait is, is identified and we, know, we need to know what to edit. Uh, sometimes the, the customers come to us with the gene already identified. Sometimes we help them to identify the gene of interest. Sometimes it's located in a coding region. Sometimes it's outside the coding regions for a regulatory element. The second part is the, the guide design in which we, we uh, design the edit, the, how the edit will be, and the guide RNA that will be used for MAT7. And we use a non-transgenic manner with uh, ribonucleic proteins that we produce the protein and the guide RNA, and that is introduced at the protoplast stage, and the, that is where the edit is happening. So therefore, there is no integration of foreign DNA into your material. And we have, as I said, the proprietary design software to design this guide optimally, so you do not have to do many, many guides until you find the ones that edit in, in vivo very well. The third aspect is the entry in the cell. So we have several systems to make the, these the particles to go into the plant, through the plant cell wall, and we managed to get 
editing being done in the protoplast, and, and, and so far I will explain a little bit more about that. And the fourth aspect is the regeneration. The regeneration is we manage to get this protoplast back to the callus stage, and then from the callus stage regenerate to the full plant. And these full plants go back to the to the to the to the customers for for growing the greenhouses and then test for the for the trait of interest that has been added. And here we have several technologies as the single cell regeneration I was mentioned. Also, we are using new materials like hydrogels coming from the from the medical field, from the organoids. And these new materials boost the, uh, the, the cell divisions that are happening during, the, during regeneration and, and speed up all this process of regeneration, which usually is the bottleneck in this in this whole project process. Uh, just to give you a feeling for how happy are we with the MAT7. Uh, as I'm saying, when we receive the material from the, from the customer, we get it to the protoplast, and then in that stage is what MAT7, we, with the guide RNA, makes the, 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 the edits, and we test them by uh, next generation sequencing. We look at this protoplast, we collect the DNA, and we sequence we, the, the region on where we think that the, the edit is happening, and we, we assess that around 40 and sometimes 60 or even 70 percent of the case the reads that they are coming there already contain edits and the type of edits you can see them in the alignments here on the on the, on the right you can see them this type of indels mostly mostly these deletions that you can see here that uh, basically if they are in the in the in a coding region they will give us a knockout phenotype very clearly so so the fact that we have such a high efficiency how many of these protoplasts already contain edits allows us to do not introduce any type of selection in this screening procedure. So, so we manage to get it everything without adding any marker or any selection that we need to do. It's, it's, it, we have so high efficiency that with a few plates in which we are looking at the plant individually, which one contains the edit, with a few plates, we, we are sure that one of them or several of them contains already the edit of interest. No foreign DNA needs to be added. This is a great, great achievement. And to tell you, the, the other aspect is that because of the MAT7 efficiency is so high, so reliable, we managed to push the editing for not only one gene, sometimes, as I'm saying, plants are very complex genomes. So this is an example of a project we did for nicotiana tobacco. That's a, an allot tetraploid. And then the customer in this case wanted to, to knock out three genes from, from, uh, from, this, uh, from this genome. And in the case of an allotetraploid, we are talking about four copies for each of the for each of the uh, the families. So at the end, we have 12 genes that they need to be knocked out, and we we decided we we designed two guides that they were basically targeting a conserved region in the exon one of the of the structure that you can see here, the gene structure. These two guides were separated 150 base pairs, and when we assessed by NGS at the protoplast stage how many of these uh, the, 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 the protoplasts, how many of them were containing edits? We found that the guide one was giving around 30% of efficiency, and guide two was giving around 20%, which is reasonable numbers. So you can imagine, okay, so now we have some, some very good numbers. But when we look at the 12 allele, we found that already around 3% of the protoplasts that we checked already contained the 12 alleles uh, completely edited. So how many protoplasts do we have to check? Around 100, 200. And with that, you will have already several protoplasts already with the 12 alleles knocked out. To, be, to do even more, more interesting in terms of uh, uh, scaling up, we're not using even an uh, NGS. So we decided to look at the, at the, at the plants and find out because the efficiency is so high that in the same cell, the two guys are able to edit with MAT7. And if that is the case, the piece in between of 150 base pairs will fall. So if that is the case, we can simply in a gel like this one that you see here, we can detect a shift in the band of around 150 base pairs. If we can detect this shift in the band, as you can see in the in the lanes with a with a blue C here, that means that partially some of the uh, alleles have doubled edit. And the very interesting thing, and that's just around 37% of the cases, but in some cases, around 0.6% of the cases, we found completely shift of the band towards the bottom, meaning that 12, the 12 alleles have lost the 150 base pairs in between of the 12 alleles. 
So this is how far you can push today the technology toward, hey, I need 12 alleles to be knocked out in just one round of editing. Yes, we can do that. This is how, thanks to the, the MAT7 efficiency, we managed to get this type of projects actually into play. The other technology that I was talking about is the single cell regeneration. We have some several technologies here that in, when you are looking at the, the typical example of try to regenerate this protoplast back to plants, if you put them in the general media that many people is using, you will end up with a protoplast that stay in that single stage and they do not grow back into, into full plants. We managed to get in the entire workflow a single cell regeneration protocol and some boosters around this protocol that allows these divisions to happen really fast and, and even in the, diluted con, in the diluted concentrations that you see even here. And when we get there, we manage to get uh, back into these plates one by one. And we can guarantee, of course, that because we are coming from one single cell, we, we know that if we grow them at this stage a little bit longer, we manage to get a piece here. We test by AGS, the ones that they are detected, the edits here, we move back to plates, we put them in shoot generating media, and we started to see the plants coming back. And this is where the customer goes back. Plants with a homozygous edit inside, ready for commercialization in just one round. And this is an amazing, an amazing achievement. Um, we are also developing other technologies, and I will go briefly through these ones, because sometimes the protoplast is not uh, suitable for all the plants to go back to, to, plant, to the full grown plants. Sometimes we need to overcome these problems that this is called recalcitrancy. Some plants are really, really recalcitrant to be transformed. And one way of avoiding this is we have developed several nanoparticle delivery systems in which they go through the plant cell wall and they manage to deliver actively the cargo that is, that is out there. In, our, in this case, it was it's just to show an example of what happens if we encapsulate a protein, in this case, a fluorescent market, and, that has a nuclear localization signal. Once, once we do that, if we, if we do not encapsulate anything, here we see a bunch of cell plant cells that they are in vitro, but they, they still keep intact the plant cell wall. Nothing happens if you are not encapsulated, but when you encapsulate it in the nanoparticles, you can see the fluorescence going into the cells, and also you can detect the punctuated pattern of the nuclear localization signal being active. So it's an active delivery of the, of the, in this case, the fluorescent market. So we have nanoparticle delivery systems that works in plants and they can overcome recalcitrancy and, and allows us to have access to uh, species that right now other, other competitors actually are not able to edit and we can edit. So this is a very good thing. Of course, the spin off of this was, yes, as I was saying, how we're going to get efficiency for delivering agrochemicals in, 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 in the agriculture because this is another, another of the important aspects and that's why we think that these nanoparticle delivery systems, we call them plentrans, uh, are gonna play a very big role in the coming future. We, we are talking about nano delivery as, as a way to go towards sustainable agriculture. We see that with the traditional way of applying agrochemicals, this is bad for the environment, very inefficient, and also the, the, consumer, the, the farmer is paying a lot for product that is actually not reaching the plant. With the nano uh, delivery, we find out way less of the active ingredient being uh, in the field, much more targeted to the plants, much more targeted to the to the to the existing the tissues that is there, and less less environmental impact by order of magnitude, which is a major major change. We see that this is a, a way of having more efficient use of the active ingredients. We see increased bioavailability that will lead to less waste and less environmental impact. We can customize and control the release over time of the active ingredient that is inside of these nanoparticles. And the very good thing and makes a difference from other nano, uh, nano delivery systems out there is our plant trans molecules are biodegradable and compatible with ecological agriculture. And here comes maybe maybe one of the tricks. Now, using the new technologies, maybe we can make ecological agriculture actually feasible, which is a very important thing. And for us, it has been a very important decision from the commercial perspective to use a pit stock to make the plant trans affordable for scalability. And what we can do now is, is go through the plant cell wall. The cargo doesn't really matter to us. And that's why we have the applications of the plant trans into the different segments in the agrochemical space. And that's what we are right now exploring actively. And, and as I'm seeing, so what we see is very different applications. We are moving from the lab scale towards field scale applications with different types of cargos. 
with different uh, type of applications. And we have not only one system, but we have actually up to, up to three systems to, 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 to deliver this. Um, the final wrap up, let me show you that we are moving towards the future in the Tiger workflow. We're expanding our capabilities for the bioinformatics, for the Tiger identification. Recently, we announced the collaboration with, with a company called Computomics, a German company, for the accelerate, which we're, we're joining forces to identify regulatory genes or genes involved in, in traits that they are not still known. And together with our Tiger workflow, we will make available to companies that they are still looking for the gene of interest that better know what it is. A very interesting proposal out there. Uh, we are increasing the capacity for, for the, the MAT7. We are actually, thanks to Inscript and our license to sell MAT7. And we recently add in our scientific advisory board, the Professor John van der Oost, that is very well known in the community for CRISPR. Uh, in the entry of the cell, the plant trans molecules that we we're mentioning, we are adding a new scientific advisor very soon. And for the regeneration, the single cell that I was talking to you about, also we are scaling up the, the, the handling capacity to, to provide more and more traits. In, in one round, but also more and more screening if we need to scale up the number of, of protocols that need to be to be assessed. But also, as you can see, we can automate the single cell embedding, the screening. We are increasing our capabilities in terms of the number of conditions that we can test for regeneration, but also the number of protocols that we can assess for editing. And again, very recently also, we, we added the scientific advisor uh, in, this, in this aspect, the P Professor Patricia Sanchez. Um, just in a nutshell, so that's why Hudson River Biotechnology has become a very popular uh, company out there in terms of the gene aid in space in plants. We have companies from all sizes uh, coming to us to talk about what's going on and, and, and tell us, okay, sometimes we need some other specific technologies to be, uh, to, to be incorporated maybe in our, in our pipeline. Sometimes they come with the whole crisp end-to-end -to -end solution. And that's sometimes very, very, very interesting for them. Uh, not only from the seed uh, industry, also from the ingredient companies, and also from the biotech companies from the pharmaceutical sector. So, so you can see that we are trying to create mutual success between our technologies and the things that they are developing internally from their R&D side. And we can talk about collaborations from the breeding projects or maybe technological co-developments or finally something more, more long-term, like a strategic partnership. So I hope that that was uh, in a nutshell what I wanted to discuss. And this is the people right now in the company actually slightly old so we have more people that are joining the company and i'm very happy to uh, to answer any of the questions that you can have well thank you ben and gabino both for your informative presentations we will now start the live q a portion of the webinar if you have a question you'd like to ask please do so now just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, what is your ability to edit bases versus knockouts? Yes. Uh, so the question there is that um, the problem of editing bases is that, yeah, we can do that. So we can do what is called HDR. And in that case, you use a guide uh, RNA that contains already a mismatch, and that uh, mismatch is that the, the edit by base that you will introduce there. Uh, versus a knockout, which is a random process happening when the nuclease makes a double strand break and repairs by itself, and then during that repair moment there is a pindel, and that is un unguided. So the problem there is that, it, as I was saying before, is the difference between SDN1 and SDN2. If we introduce the, the, the base edit, we will have an SDN2 product that is not really commercially attractive right now due to regulatory problems. While SDN1s, which mostly give up the knockouts, are the ones that they are mostly demanded by the, by the sector. Great, thank you, Gabino. All right, our next question asks, do you use MAD7 in your Tiger system or MAD7 variants? Right now, what we have is the MAD7, not the variant. Either. And but as you can see, I mean, the point is that we've been working uh, uh, adopting MAT7 in our protocol, and, and now we managed to get this efficiency so high. And this is something that, it, it, yeah, it, it is. It, that's the key aspect for us to to reach this this type of efficiency. So we are also always try open to other type of nucleases uh, in case we do not find 
a pump that is uh, in, the, in the gene of interest or in the region of interest, or we are looking for different uh, physical parameters. We are always open for, for new nucleases, but our main business is just with MAT7 assays. Great, thank you. All right, next question. What species are already editable with your system? I cannot disclose <laughs> for, for confidentiality issues which one, but I can say that at least a dozen that we have in our tiger world for different from different families. And that goes uh, all, all over the, the phylogenetic uh, plant tree. So, so the point is that what I was saying from the beginning, we, we try to be a technology provider that is species agnostic. So what we see is that uh, it works uh, from, from different species, from different families. And what we see is that the requirements are different for making them going through all the work, all the workflow. Most of the times, as I was saying, the, the bottleneck is the regeneration protocol. And even in the same species, we found varieties that they are going very well immediately and varieties that they are recalcitrant for the same, in the same condition. So it's a very spe species and even variety dependent process. Great. All right. Next question. Do you have your system working well with soybean? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very, very, very good question because it's one of the most uh, interesting targets, as I'm saying, for, for soybean. Right now, it's, it's, not, it's not in our in our portfolio, but uh, we are incorporating somebody that's actually an expert on soybean because we, we really expect to have soybean working in the, in the next few months. But yeah, that is one of, one of the most important uh, groups out there, yeah. Great. All right, next question here. Has MAD7 been used in whole plant tissue culture? If so, does it only work via biolistics on embryogenic callus, or has it been tried with agrobacterium and or nanotube transformation systems? And not in our tiger workflow, we haven't tried the last one. And, and, and we see biolistics not being so efficient for what we want. So at the end, we've been using the, the normal PEG transfection methods in the protoplast stage, and that's what has been the best by far. Um, with the use of nanoparticles, uh, like the plant trans molecules, what we are achieving now is to introduce the, the editing machinery into, let's say, different stages, like, like the callus stage, and, and then we, we see success there, uh, but we haven't done it in, in other tissues. So that's something that we are is, is something that maybe is interesting to, to do experiments in the future. But right now, we are successful at the protoplast stage and we can overcome recalcitrancy if, uh, with the nanoparticles at the decalus stage. Thank you. All right, another question here asks, how can we get access to MAD7 for our own experiments? Yeah, so um, we do provide the sequence of MAD7 on our website and also some quick start guides. And um, that's if you're able to use MAD7 uh, as a plasmid in your system or potentially mRNA or, or other systems where, where it's able to be synthesized. Uh, if you would prefer to use uh, protein um, for your experiments with MAD7, as Camino mentioned, um, Hudson River uh, manufacturing the protein are able to supply uh, some, uh, you know, some protein for your experiments. Also, working with other third parties, um, you know, uh, to manufacture MAD7 at a larger scale, and, and hopefully we'll have more information about that soon. Thank you, Ben. This next question asks: Are those efficiencies as high for all species? I mean, there is some variation between different species, but yes, in general, yeah, they're very high. And I, I'm, I'm saying 40 because the, my R&D department uh, says, okay, says 40, because we get usually more than 40, but they say, okay, just to be on the safe side, for most of the species, we get around 40%, yes. Great. All right, next question. Can you comment on the potential to apply your tech to pharmaceutical applications of plants? Yeah, that's, that's something that's already been, been done. And so the idea is that um, you can use the, the, the tiger workflow to metabolic engineer particular plants to increase the content of, of high value, high valuable compounds, uh, knockouts, key transcription factors related to metabolic pathways. So there are ways right now 
to, to use this technology to improve existing plants for increasing uh, the pharmaceutical uh, compounds that are growing there. This is part, part, part of the possibilities. Um, and of course, you can create your own pathways there. But then again, it becomes a different story if you are introducing, let's say, foreign genes into your plant of interest, then you will have, again, the regulatory the regulatory framework that you will have to work out but yeah yeah definitely we can definitely this is something that we could we could do today wonderful well it looks like we have time for one more question here and this attendee mentioned great presentation Gabino. how are you dealing with traits whose genes are unknown most disease resistance genes are unknown but are only selected through linked markers how do you work with customers to work on such yeah, as I said, uh, usually they come with a gene of interest that has been already described, so we, we target it to that gene. But in the case that they don't know, we we, collab we, we try to collaborate with, uh, with universities, but now we have a collaboration with Computomics, a German company that is specialized in the use of the machine learning uh, of omics data, and they are able to provide candidate genes for, uh, for the trait of interest, and, and usually they are able to narrow down to the, to the candidate gene that has more likely the chance to be the responsible for the trait of interest. And the fact that we, with the Tiger workflow, we can uh, do many genes, we can test, validate many genes to be the responsible for the trait, we can actually use the Tiger workflow to, to uh, validate which one is actually responsible. So there is a very good synergy between both companies uh, because they can increase the knowledge until we narrow down to a few candidates. And with the Tiger workflow, we managed to validate the potential candidate genes. And as you can imagine, with the company of interest, we can build IP upon, upon that. So that's that's a very good opportunity for even for a known for a known target gene. Wonderful. Well thank you again, Ben and Gabino, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Inscripta, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.